Thanks for listening to Creative Leadership. I'm Morgan, and I'm here with Arna. Today, we're going to talk to Payal Vadva, the Vice President of Innovation, Strategy, and Design at Frog. Yeah. So that was a what, what do you think? What was the conversation for you? What did it uh, spark? Yeah, the conversation, it was really rich. And like I said at the end, I can't believe that it was, it felt like we covered so much in such a short amount of time. But it mm -hmm. really, one of the main things that she talked about was was orchestrating in the, in the role of the designer mm -hmm. and that she's connecting the dots between these things that are seemingly not related, but there's always a thread that connects them. And I think that gave me a lot of inspiration and energy towards knowing, okay, these things that I'm interested in, even if it doesn't make sense on paper right now, it's going to come back right. and be useful somehow. Yeah. So you're not wasting time <laughs> doing something that you're actually really interested in and exactly. really like, but you're like, that's wasting time. I, I should do something that makes more sense. Should be more focused. Yeah, I should. should be focused. Yeah, she should be more focused because, you know, your career, your future, your pension. Got it. Logic. <laughs> Logic. Yes. Logic. Exactly. Um, no. But you knew that. I but, knew that, but we confirmed it. Yeah, it, but it's nice, right? It's nice to have someone confirm it and yeah. you go like, ah, see, see, <laughs> see, I was yeah. right. Yeah, I agree. And um, no, I, I totally agree. And 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 so a lot of recognition, also new things, obviously, uh, because, I mean, she comes from a very different background mm -hmm. uh, than, than I. And so I, so also new things really like, huh, interesting how sort of that has shaped her kind of worldview. Um and but I really so if you you know if you listen to it, um, listen to the language, because mm -hmm. I was really kind of very interested um, with the language that she uses. Um, there's a lot of you know what I also call framing, sort of using language mm -hmm. to kind of kind of give meaning to it or kind of frame it in a certain certain ways so it makes sense, like orchestration, for instance, yeah. orchestration. Uh, but there's there's a lot of that. Like, you know, it's, it shows you how she uses language to kind of basically make sense of these things, connect things that are seemingly uh, uh, disconnected. But in her language, she already kind of starts creating sort of these kind of connections. And 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 although, and we talk about it in the end with her, but, you know, uh, using theater and all the sort of the language that belongs to theater or the frames that belong to theater, using mm -hmm. that as well as sort of like, you know, and, I, and that really resonated most with me. I think, you know, isn't everything theater, isn't, you know, isn't everything we do if you, if you, you know, as a designer, but in general, really in work, if you think about it as theater, it sounds silly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, you also, you have a role to play what, you know, there, did you kind of, you know, your script. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah, there's a phrase that we had uh, that we would say naming is framing. Hmm. Ah, so then you know. to bring up the use of her language is because she really paints a picture of and connects things in this this way and uh, how she, the words that she used and she talked about her uh, design school experience. Um, she said it was yeah. a fest. It was a five year fest. Yeah. And that really frames it and gives me a different image. Um, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah, that, to me, those, those are like frames. So you kind of see it as a fest and then all of a sudden it's not school, it's a fest. And then the image in your head changes because all yeah. of a sudden I see these people and balloons. I don't know why. <laughs> I saw balloons. Yeah. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, lots of things going on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. exactly. Lots of stuff, messy stuff. And I don't yeah. know where, where the balloons come from. But it's a yeah. fest. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. So... That was really, um, it's, I think it's a relevant conversation uh, also for people in design, um, mm -hmm. but also for people who kind of, kind of, I wanted to say fell out of design, fell out, grew out of design of like, that's also what she talks about, right? Kind of she, her yeah. craft basically, right? Yeah. So, and reinvent herself and the difference. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which, which I think uh, we all do. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah you start somewhere and you kind of is that and it's a it's not just like that's a normal thing or that should happen it's also a question like is that something you should do because you're losing 
the thing that you maybe love the most, uh, your craft and, you know, doing those things. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're only, you're only talking about it <laughs> and other people are doing it. And you're like, Hmm, I don't know. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it gave me a lot of inspiration and then also makes me think about how um, the way that her parents supported her. They said, you know, they didn't know the world that I was in, but they trusted me that I knew the world that I was in the best. And um, I think it's really great gift that her parents gave her in that. Yeah. Um, but then also trusting myself is, okay, I, I am the expert of my world that I'm in. Uh, yeah. I'm not an expert of everything in my world, but I'm the expert of my world. And what does that mean? next step look like for me hmm. cool all right let's uh let's yeah. listen to the conversation i'm a designer that is who i am uh i'm a designer outside of work and i'm a designer at work uh but what i identify with if there was a thing that i have to um a hook that i have to find to talk about who i am I'm a designer. Um, but if someone's absolutely not interested in design, uh, then I'm someone who solves really complex problems. And I have a great time doing that. That's yeah, right. it's me. Yeah. That's you. Um, it's, uh, it's always, it's, it's always a, a good uh, start of a 10 because it, usually people are like, what kinds of problems do you actually solve? Do you really think you're smarter than everyone else? And usually my answer is no. Uh, but I like to go after big problems, and I quite like that. And um, so, which is, which is, I mean, there's so many questions for me now. First of all, because it's interesting to say I am a designer, that's who I am. And uh, um, so, I mean, can you remember when that started? When you went like, you know, you know something? I'm, I'm going to solve complex problems, and I'm a designer. No, no, I'm not, I'm not an engineer. No, no, no. I'm a designer. <laughs> no, self. When, when is that? Because I mean, it resonates with me. But when does that start? Do you know? So it. I stumbled into design by accident. I stumbled into design because my mother wanted me to go to design school, and she had no idea what design school was, but she knew that it was where. I could explore lots of different things and then figure it out. And I think one of the things my family is very good at, and I think that's what I get from my parents, is they figure it out. Uh, they've never had it easy, but they have figured out a way to make sense and make meaning of the work that they do. So I think I was pretty confused at school. I, uh, I wanted to be an architect. Uh, then I read The Fountainhead and realized I didn't want to be an architect. Um, <laughs> Interesting mm. point. Never read Fountainhead. Uh, no, never give your child a Fountainhead to read between the ages of 12 and 16 because their hormones are messing them up in any case. So they don't really understand what they're reading. Because I reread the Fountainhead when I was 19 and I was like, hold on one second. I didn't understand it the first time. I really want to be an architect, but now I'm in design school. So, you know. Ah, yeah. But uh, um, <laughs> too bad. I, I, I didn't, yeah, too bad. Didn't get it the first time. Good but, advice. Do never read the Fountainhead. <laughs> I would say never read Fountainhead, period. Yeah, fair enough. It's yeah, such a, I, it's I a, think that it's a it's a it's a waste of time. It's 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 really <laughs> it's a seriously. waste of time. But <laughs> no, well, it, in in a way, it is. It would waste your brain, and it and it's such a weird, dark kind of. Yeah, know, well, but that's some... good, right? You need something to mess your brain up a little. Yeah, maybe, but maybe, yeah, okay, maybe you're right. Yeah, okay. there's an yes. age for it. Yeah, there's but, an age for um... it. <laughs> exactly. When your brain is already messed up because you're a teenager. Exactly. Yes. That's it. That's too much messing up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so that. So, I think I came to that realization that I am a designer when I was in the second year of university. So um, design school in India is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, when I went to design school in India, there were two design schools in India. One was a design school you went to if you wanted to study fashion. That's it. If you did fashion, you went to that design school. I didn't want to study fashion. That was the end of the matter. So I went to the other design school. And the other design school was uh, what I know to be the place that changed my life. Uh, it was a five-year degree. It was set up at the time of the independence of the country by the first prime minister of the country, inviting in the brightest minds from across the world to set up institutions of national importance. And uh, they brought in, as you may imagine, Charles and Ray Eames. So, you know, it wasn't set up by small I people I remember that. doing yeah. some 
like little things in the corner of the world it was set up by charles ray so yeah. they wrote a report which is called the india report that really looked at what did india need and what they suggested back was a way of design education that would look at solving problems that india would encounter over the next many decades and so it was an indoctrination into design it was an indoctrination into a way of life it was an indoctrination into understanding that your problems have no bearing upon the world the world has bigger problems to solve and you are a very small part of those problems and you have to do something about them and it was a five year degree and it was a very good level up you know i i went i'd gone to what you would consider to be a good school and what i mean by good school it wasn't like i wasn't a rich kid who went to a school where you know i hung out with other rich kids but i went to a school that valued education and the teachers valued it too and so you got a decent education out of it right so i'd gone to one of those schools and when i got and i and i i i lived in a home where i had a roof above my head and we had enough we never had more but we never had less we had enough and when i got to the national institute of design which is what it's called and it's in amdavad it's 1600 kilometers away from where my home was it was the first time i met india they they would only take in 60 people in a batch and it was the first time i actually discovered that there was so much more about my country and about the ways people live that i had no idea about i lived such a sheltered life and so i think the first year was uh, hard because i was not sure of what i'd opted into and it was a it was very free as a form of education it was very liberal in its ways of being i'd been pretty sheltered i was never allowed to get out of the house with my friends after like 2 pm in the afternoon and here i was living on this campus where there were no restrictions everyone was on first name basis in a pretty hierarchical country and uh, you had mixed hostels and it was a bit of a fest let's just keep it at that it was it was it was a way of opening up your brain at the age of 6 and making you realize you were in the deep end of the sea and the world was your oyster i suddenly realized that actually you know what i am a designer and i can actually affect change and i think that was really um that has actually been the thing that has stayed with me throughout which is i can affect change in my smallest possible way but i know i can make a difference and that actually guides everything i do which is knowing that you have uh the agency of being able to do something about stuff and i think that sort of brings in my sense of leadership and where i draw from i'm curious so you mentioned something in the beginning which was my uh, your um, you said my parents never had it easy um that stuck in my mind what exactly does it mean how how what, what do you mean but they didn't have it easy we were we i i come from a humble background but mm-hmm. we were not poor we weren't mm-hmm. like striving for to make sure the next day was going to be okay we weren't in that place mm-hmm. but we we never had any more than we needed right like mm-hmm. so it was comfortable okay we had three meals a day all of those all of that good stuff right like so i wasn't like I, w- I wasn't striving like they didn't have to like the, the, there were struggles but they weren't like there are bigger struggles in life right and i think now having traveled enough for the world and having known enough about the world i realized that you know the things that i could have compounded as being big issues when i was younger are not big issues we had a decent comfortable upbringing but if you think about it i um, the reason why they never had it easy is because because i am the third generation of independent india i'm the third generation of my country the first generation of my country were my grandparents and my grandparents came over the border so they came through the partition so they, you know it was it was a new homeland for them and they didn't have a choice right like they had to struggle and like mm. that was real struggle to even figure out existence and to sustain yourself and to educate yourself and to make sense of the world that you had found yourself in and all of the stuff that comes with it hmm. because they worked as hard and they worked up a chain of education and understanding that world my parents had it slightly easier right but my parents still had to follow 
a few things, which is they had to go make sure that they got uh, secure jobs. Uh, they they had to make sure that they worked like 18 hours a day to make sure that there was food on the table. They had to make sure that they never gave up. They had to make, you know, giving up is not a thing that you do in my family. You don't give up. But it's quite fun. Every time I've quit my job in, in, in like in the last few times, my mother like reacts as if I'm failing. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not failing. I'm just, I've been, I've been doing this for a while. I just need to get me a job. Just calm down. Um, but it's interesting, right? Like you don't fail. You don't like, you just keep going at it. And, you know, the whole Indian uh, way of being, which is you just work really, really hard and then you hope for the best and you always do the right thing and you hope for the best and you pray very hard and you hope for the best, you know. It's all of those things that they did. But they didn't have a choice. They just did what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when I see it now, I have had every opportunity to decide what I want to do. I reinvent myself every few years. And I have the ability to think about this and stop and almost indulge myself in what next. I don't think my parents ever did that. And that's what I mean by they had to they had to work hard to make things happen. And I don't think they've ever stopped my you know, they're still working. And you know, it's quite mad. Uh, and they should stop doing it. So if they ever listen to this, I should tell them to go sit on a beach and stop working, which they need to do. <laughs> Take some time and relax. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was that your mother was the one who encouraged you to go to design school, even though she didn't know what design school was. And and I think, you know, you hear parents, they have these big dreams for their children. And so I find that also quite a unique thing. Oh, I don't know what design school is, but I think you should go there. And so what do you think it was about you and what her perception was of design school that she thought it might be something for you? Well, that's a good question. Uh so I've always been a dabbler. And what I mean by that, I'm a jack of all trades. And I'm a master of some, but I have, uh, I get really bored very quickly. So, and I think my mother knew that, right? Like I would want to learn tennis and to swim and would possibly like to go play badminton and would possibly like to also learn to play carom and to play chess. And those were my options in the evening when I, you know, post school and in school I wanted to study all the sciences and I also wanted to study some of the common subjects and I really wanted to do some of the arts and you know you can only do one of those three things and so my mother was very clear the one I, I love to learn I'm a quintessential learner I'm a learner for life like I can just like if someone could pay for me to be at university forever I'm taking you up on it right now I don't <laughs> mind an exam at all like I could just learn that's I could do that for a living so I think she was looking f for advice and someone someone mentioned to her that, look, if she's the sort of person who can't, you know, focus on just one thing, but likes to connect the dots and then make sense of it and likes to be good at some things, but also be comfortable not being good at some things so that she can, but, you know, keep doing it enough times over, then architecture may be really hard work because it's about one thing. It's still about building buildings. And my mother knew about my gravitation or pull around architecture. But I think sensibly, this person did say to my mother that actually design would give her a broader palette to work from. So I went to design school thinking I wanted to be an industrial designer. I got out of design school five years later as an exhibition and museum designer. And so, you know, a bit of a shift. <laughs> uh, but yeah. that was because I loved history. I loved the mm -hmm. idea of building something that was physical exactly. and that, you know, there was still the built environment involved. Yeah, exactly. But I really liked the idea of curation and I really liked the idea of semiotics. And I loved the idea of telling stories and I loved the idea of observing behaviors over long periods of time and durational studies of behavior. And somehow it made sense in museum designs, yeah. That's what I ended up studying. Yeah, exactly. Um, because yeah, that does fit with all you know the idea of being an architect uh, a little bit. It, it, I mean, it's is it, the the um, if you design things, if you create things mm -hmm. that you can also kind of you know it's physical, but like like architects, they can walk inside of their kind of designs and their things they can which is amazing so um i am not smart enough to be an architect but if i would have been and and i read fountainhead so that messed me up so, <laughs> well, not I, so I, I 
because I got out and I practiced architecture for a while. And I obviously didn't have a degree in it, right? But as a person who studied exhibition design, interested in architecture, I went to work for architects. It made mm-hmm. sense in mm-hmm. my head. All of this, honestly, if someone's listening doesn't make sense, but in my head, it makes absolute <laughs> sense. So I went to work for architects and and did that for the first few years of actually my career and also being in India. And I don't say it lightly, but the skills that I learned there on the job of actually building buildings, I just built my house where I'm talking to you from. I built it in London. I don't have a degree. I hope it doesn't fall on me. But, you know, <laughs> here's what I think. I, I also feel like there are things you can learn on the job that school can't teach you. And I, that's what is really interesting to me. Of How do you draw on the skills that can only be taught in real life, like when you get out of schools? Because architecture learned in an architectural practice is very different from architecture learned in a school. Because you're making real things. Someone's paying you money to build it. Mm. And so the decision decisions that you take at that point in time are very different from decisions you take on paper when you're in school thinking about architecture. It's quite interesting that you you went to that school that was founded by uh, Charles and Ray Eames. Um, I I actually used, um, um, at least there's a documentary about them, and I used that uh, for for students uh, to watch that, actually to teach them about design thinking. Uh, but also to show them that that kind of mindset and the way of thinking isn't new, um, and the way they kind of develop things and, and their prints based on on their principles, and sort of that connection between you know their 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 principles of, of design and then that you could you could see that in their, their design. And so I was teaching uh, students about you know if you have your principles and then you come up with your ideas and your concept, I want to see those principles. So if you say, oh, we're all about the sustainability, but I don't see it in your design. So, but I used um, uh, Charles and Ray's, Ray's, uh, as an example for uh, also being the way they um, organized themselves. So there's this wonderful piece in the documentary about their studio where, you know, mm-hmm. everything is going on. You can imagine it's like this amazing, totally messy messed up place with you know they were making films and were, so it wasn't like no no we we're doing only this no they were doing everything so exactly curiosity and uh you know that kind of i um so anyway is that, you know I, so I, I anyway in the documentary they talk about the school so i was like oh you went there that's amazing yeah it was like five years of honestly being at a festival there's no other way to put it and actually I must say it wasn't just them who founded the school it was also um, these two people in Ahmedabad so this school is in Ahmedabad which is Mm. in the western part of India Mm. uh, which is uh, where a lot of the textile mills were in India pre-independence and Mm. also post-independence and uh, where therefore because cotton production was such a big thing where a lot of the industrialist families were and therefore, it's a pretty rich part of the country. And this is Gujarat, you know. So you, you would know Gujarat and Ahmedabad is the capital city. Well, it is in the capital city. Do not please make me say that on the podcast. So it's in Gujarat and it's in Ahmedabad. Um, and uh, Ahmedabad is, um, you know, it's a, it's a cultural center. So everyone's granddaddy did something important in Ahmedabad. So Louis Kahn built in Ahmedabad. Mm. Uh, Kobuzia was in Ahmedabad, right? Like you name it and they were in Ahmedabad. And Ahmedabad had this gravitational pull because there were these families with uh, who, who were wealthy, but also very aware of the world and what was happening in the world that attracted. And um, they, they basically played patrons of the arts. And so the school was also founded by Gautam and Gira Sarabhai. And uh, Gira Ben died a couple of years ago and if you think about her journey as a, as a woman from one of those families, and you know these are also families that are that were incredibly progressive. If you think about what a woman in in the forties and the fifties in India managed to achieve to form these institutions, and I think for me it's uh, those legacies are really interesting. So yes, Charles and Ray Eames are you know um, important people in the lexicon of design. Mm. And, and well understood in the Western world. Uh, but it becomes just as important to think about what is happening in like 
the parts of the world that I come from and actually mm. the legacies of design and the legacies of culture because to me those are incredibly rich um, and and their contribution to I guess what happens everywhere in the world like there is I'm, I'm one of 60 from my batch but there are so many batches of people from the National Institute of Design who are across the world and uh, those, I mean, you know, when I grow up, I want to be Gira Sarvai. Like, imagine that legacy of being able to have that impact on the world to set up a school like that, yeah. where where people can learn. It, uh, yeah, that was pretty incredible. And when you were, and of course, looking at that legacy and that impact that she's been able to have um, is absolutely incredible. And were those who who did you look up to and who inspired you when you were a kid? It's a very hard one because I, I, I still don't have an answer to that question. When I applied to uh, the National Institute of Design, that's a question they asked us, actually. Which is, who do you look up to? And I clearly remember the answer I wrote and I clearly remember what my mother said to me when I wrote it. Because, you know, you had, you had to fill this form and send it off. And this is before the internet. Um, I basically said, I do not look up to anyone because I find it very hard to pin all of my hope and all of my admiration onto one person. And so I would find it very hard to answer this question. This is 16 years old. I was 16 years old at that point in time. I still find it hard to look up to one person. There are lots of people I, I admire. It's not like I don't look up to people, but I don't, I don't seek people who are exactly like me to look up to them. I actually find inspiration in many different places. Mm. And then together that forms a basis of what I think good looks like. And, you know, that inspiration comes from lots of lots of different areas of work and areas of thought. And so, uh, and, and that changes all the time. So it's also, I don't have a fixture. It's not like, yes, I want to grow up and be Gira Sarabhai, but I also want to be many other people. When I grow up, that's the problem. Um, mm -hmm. so it depends on what I'm reading also. Yeah, that changes things <laughs> massively. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm reading a lot about... Uh, the understanding of uh, how we got here with respect to economic growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a whole lot of economists who I am massively fangirling on right now. To just, and, you know, if you ask me right now who I want to be when I grow up, I want to be one of them. So, yeah. Ah, yeah. Um, which is obviously uh, something that is really part of now uh, you know thinking about you know the if you because when you think about the, the big problems to solve um we think about you know sustainability but quite quickly you go into economics and new economics right um so is it something as a designer um you know i you know i've always felt that I'm an imposter or a trespasser often <laughs> that, you know, uh, because I, I, I can do kind of, you know, venture into these kind of fields, these, these bubbles of, uh, expertise where I don't belong. Um, so like economics, <laughs> just to name one, um, so that I'm always like, oh, I actually, I didn't study this or I, I, um, but I'm really curious about it. I'm interested in it. And, uh, and I, and I actually have, I want to have an opinion about it, but do I have a right to have an opinion about it? Do I have a, do I have a right to speak about this as not, uh, being in this case, maybe the economist or being the, um, the, 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 the futurist or being the, the, the marketeer or being the, um, I don't know. There's so many things I'm not, there's yeah. way more things I'm not, by the way, than I am, which is like annoying. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, but what, what, what is your kind of, uh, because, you know, when you, when you're looking at um, complex problems, you, you typically, you know, you, you are in a uh, you know you come in you you kind of you you become a sort of a trespasser in a way on people who are experts in something that you also want to connect to your solution. How how does that? I mean, yeah. that does that rec uh, do you recognize that or? I do. I sort of see it in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're right. We can't be everything, but at the same, and I think that's actually very important too be very aware of I'm I think I like to think I'm pretty self-aware which means I actually know what I'm not good at and then with everything else I try and figure my life out around the rest of it where I think I'm a little good at some things and then I could be better right? mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I'll strive pretty hard to make sure I am, I get to that point. So I'm not suggesting I am good at everything or, uh, you know, everyone should be good at everything or a designer should be good at everything. But what a designer should not be and what the age is definitely over for is designers being rock stars. There mm. are no design rock stars in the world anymore. And a world where we had designed rock stars is long over. So Charles and Reeves. And the reason for that is, yes, exactly. And, you know, yeah. full power to them for having been those people. But if you think about how they even talk about their own practice, yeah, yeah. they talk about their team. Yeah. They don't talk about themselves. We talk about them. And that becomes really interesting because for me, design is a hugely collaborative activity because you solve big problems and one person should not solve all those big problems because you can't. So I think that age of the rock star is over. The age of deep collaboration, I, I, I hope we're living in it. But I think there's a whole lot of senseless collaboration going on as well. And I think we need to sort of emerge out of that, raise the bar on how we talk about quality, raise the bar on thought, raise the bar on quality of action that comes off the back of that thought. And make sure that we're actually um, solving problems with the right people around the table, as opposed to just solving problems because we think we've surrounded ourselves with people at the table. You have this like everything work. I, I think half the art of design is in knowing who sits around the table with you or which table to go and sit on if you don't get invited, which is pretty often. You don't get invited to lots of tables, but knowing which table to pick. And I think that's really interesting because I had always wanted wanted this job I do today. Right? So I work at Frog. I my first internship that I applied for was to Frog. This was twenty years ago. Um, this is this this is all I wanted. But I think what I have figured through trial and error practice, and I think a lot of hard work is uh, not making sure I don't go after everything and for the things that I go after, sticking to it. What I mean by that is we can feel like imposters when we dip in and out of things and where we think we can have any kind of conversation. The truth is we can't. Design will not solve every problem. Let's just, I, I believe it. I'm a designer and I will not solve every problem as much as I like to go after big, complex problems. I think designers have also found themselves in a trap of um, some sort of uh, putting ourselves on a pedestal where we think we are actually good at everything. We are not. Let's just get that out there. The things that we are good at, we have to pick our battles and we have to pick who we surround ourselves by to actually solve these things because otherwise it's not worth it. So I think where I find myself really comfortable where I don't file myself as an imposter is when I've actually studied something and spent some time on it so mm. but I also understand that nothing is so complex that you can't learn it and that to me is the dichotomy to work through and what I mean by that is today I spend 80 percent of my time working in financial services banking capital markets insurance if you told me for six years ago, this is what I would be saying to you today. I would laugh myself out of the room because I knew nothing about it. And I could definitely not hold my own in a conversation. But I can today because I have spent five straight years learning something about it. Can I have um, can I have a conversation? about the future of financial instruments and how products change the lives of people who actually engage with them when they are financial services products, yes. Can I tell you everything about uh, regulation in the financial services industry? Possibly not, but I can tell you a little, a little about it, right? Like of the things that touch upon my world. But what I've had to do is ring fence it to say, I am not an imposter in this part of the financial services world. And I am definitely an imposter in the, other bits of it, and I'm not going to pretend to be good at it. I'm going to surround myself with experts who know what they're talking about. And that's well, really helped. Mm -hmm. Well, you, I mean, you, you, you know, you said something that I think was important is that um, if um, 
you work uh, in a field where you are not an expert. You have to work with the experts. It means that you have to find the, the right people to work with, um, meaning that you also design basically, you know, the the sort of the, the people or the, com the community, the, the sort of who is it around the room. So um, I think that there's a part of design there as well, understanding like who yes. should be in the room, who, so we have the right conversation, you know, how we, we need divert, diverse, you know, set of people we need. So I have been very conscious on that, on that level of who should be, I, to me, that is uh, whether you are sort of, uh, you know, in hierarchy, uh, you know, the leader or not, but that to me is leadership. You, you know, that's a leadership uh, role where you say, I'm going to, or we call it facilitating, maybe, um, but it is a leadership role where you go like, wait a minute, we need to have those people also in a room because they're going to be important. And, and, ah, uh, we have a, you know, we don't know this, so we need, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I think that's really important to know as a, as a, when you, as a, not all designers get into that role, but, but if you, as a designer kind of get into that position to also be aware of uh, that you don't, it's not, you're not supposed to be the expert in everything. <laughs> But you can be the expert in bringing people together and designing exactly. the designing the dialogue, designing the conversation, and making that happen. And I think there is a curatorial side of it, which mm -hmm. obviously interests me just off the back of how I've always thought of curation at large, also from the mm -hmm. practice that I come out of. But then there's the orchestration side of it. It's one thing to bring people around the table. It's another to sustain that conversation and get something out mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're actually two completely different things. And then there's obviously the conversation around inclusion and that conversation around how do you make sure that, you know, you can actually deliver against that promise to a third party, usually involved in this, because I'm also talking about a strongly agency side experience here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure it's the same when you're in-house, but it's, it's you know, it's a different set of stakeholders. Uh, but that orchestration delights me because... I think curation is, we're also moving into a world where we have a lot of knowledge around us, but also many ways to consume that knowledge, rationalize that knowledge. You know, I wonder if there's a world where chat GPT could tell you who the people around the table ought to be because they know who the experts in certain areas are. I don't know, maybe. Or maybe, you know, someone else, someone, another model like chat GPT. Let's mm, not give chat probably. GPT all the, all the onus in life. So. <laughs> It's good at something. It's not very good at the others. So, but orchestration is purely down to human effort, uh, personalities, a deep understanding of behavior, a realization of patterns, an understanding of how do you actually move things along. And I think it's 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 that role of uh, uh, and maybe that's leadership, and maybe it's orchestration, and maybe it's both. I don't yeah. I don't know. But to me, it is playing uh, that master of ceremonies, but knowing that you're not just pulling things together, you're actually doing some of the doing yourself because mm. um, designers shouldn't also be, your leadership also shouldn't be just about fluff and hot air. Uh, it should be about knowing your craft. And I guess to go back to your first question around who are you, I identify with who I am based on the materiality of what I understand. And the materiality of my craft is understanding people and organizations. And mm. therefore, I am a designer who orchestrates people, organizations to be able to get somewhere. And that materiality of my craft becomes very important to me to be able to then say, who am I? Design to me is about a craft whatever that craft may be, and whatever the materiality of that craft may be. But, but, but it needs to have those two things involved. And usually that has to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. right? Like you do something to be able to affect change. You don't just do something for the sake of it. Because if you do it for the sake of it or for the sheer self-expression or possibly indulgence, depending on the side of the spectrum you sit on, that's art. That's not design. And it has its place and it has an immense value in this world because it inspires without necessarily needing to do one specific thing. It, it inspires everyone ubiquitously. But I think from design, 
that materiality, that craft is just so important. And one of the things I've been beginning to wonder is I've now been in leadership positions in the world of design for a bit. So when Anna and I crossed paths, you know, I was a design director, beginning to sort of look at an effect change. This was 2015, you know, eight years in, I'm, I've been, you could say I've been climbing the ladders of corporate organizations because most of the design agencies I've been part of have been bought. And I currently sit in an organization which is incredibly flat or incredibly hierarchical, depending on how you see it and depending on who you are within the organization, how you engage with it. Every designer would tell you that organization is as flat as it gets, right? Like we work together and we do good work. Mm. But when I reflect on what is my job and we do good work, sometimes my job can be to make sure everyone else can do good work. I'm still using the language, the craft, and the materiality of what I know in design to help them do that. And before the job that I do today, which is uh, you know, running effectively a part of the business, I used to be the head of service design. I like to think that I'm still doing service design. I'm doing service design at my team or for my team. They are the service that I work towards, right? right? Like, and I think I'm still using the same materiality. But every now and again, honestly, after you you stare at lots of spreadsheets, you begin to wonder what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it and you begin to wonder if that is the materiality of design as much. You know, uh, do is the materiality of design actually understanding if my business is growing at the pace it should? Maybe it is. You're not taught that at design school. You're not taught the uh, language of business at design school. But it is incredibly important. Am I looking at the margins like month by month? I am. Is that the language of design? And so I think there are, don't get me wrong, I still do hands-on delivery and I still love it. And I still play advisor to some really awesome like CEOs and chief product officers and all that good stuff. But I also look at some of the stuff that no one else wants to look at and you know, in those moments, you wonder, am I a designer or am I just solving a problem that's become bigger than design? And I don't know the answer to that question, but it becomes mm. an in- important one to interrogate, to continue to learn more about my material, my craft, what mm. I'm working with going forth. I also think design careers are never linear. Mine hasn't been. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think most designers wake up in the morning and they're like, right, the next corporate ladder I am going to climb and the rung above this is X. Like You're like, not really. I just want to do good work. So I think <laughs> most creative careers, most creative leadership is also very circular or almost like a tangled web of lots of things going on. Like I've gone forward, sideways, backwards, completely different direction, hidden under a blanket, come back up, possibly further up than I've wanted to be, then go, gone back down again, so hands-on been, delivery role. And I like that. What's been the career change that's made your, uh, either that's made you the most nervous or that your mother's like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> My mother for the longest time um, believed that I was, oh God, she's going to listen to this and say, yeah, that's not what I said. But my mother... I overheard her say, my daughter designs exhibitions at train stations. And I was just like, hold on one second. Where did that come from? And I don't do exhibitions at train stations. That's not what I design. But because I'd studied exhibition design, and because when I met Anna, we were working on a, well, a train network project. The big, it was, I can't name it really, but it was the biggest infrastructure project in Europe involving railways. Um, what would that be? Who knew? What would that be? <laughs> um, so I was working on that for many years. And and so, you know, she was just like train station, exhibition design, bring it together. Yeah, that's exactly. what she does. And it's like, no, that's no, 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 that's not what I do. Good um, idea, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the thing that possibly made my parents most nervous was when I started to talk about the dirty thing called money. Mm. it's really interesting my parents work really hard so I could work, work really hard and be more comfortable in life than they were and they continue to do so right like they still work and I'm like can you stop working you should be fine without us 
like you know without we will be fine without you working but they still do that but i think they still see money and i still see money as a dirty thing mm. and i think my my parents got really worried when i started talking about money because what they were really worried about was that all of the stuff that i talked about of being curious and about you know they were just like just remember to balance it out and i'm very glad that i have that ear wall where they're like yes that matters don't get us wrong yes it does but you know other things matter too mm-hmm. and i quite appreciate that sense of balance coming in from everyone around me um i think they have been a little worried at times i've been like i don't want to be a designer anymore i want to be a playwright which is why i actually moved to this country and but it's been incredible to actually see them uh oh well everyone around me for that matter be very supportive of uh tangential things i've gone after because for them they don't understand my world and that's fine but they also believe that i understand my world better than anyone else does and so if i can see the dots connecting then i should just go off and connect them mm-hmm. so which why i talk about the three careers i've had i've worked in architecture i've been a playwright and and worked in theater as a scenographer and you know and then run that in parallel with working in design service design and now effectively across innovation strategy and design and building ventures so you know in my head there is a logical string that connects it all mm-hmm. but in most other people's heads i'm sure they wonder why what i'm doing with my life but you know makes sense oh, makes sense really? to me i don't know i it's a uh, i think it's a uh, an interesting so I, again i haven't done any deep research in it but the people i know that are either uh, or they call themselves either designers or creatives or artists really um they all have these kind of uh kind of um, life journeys if you will that you are like so you did you know all these different things but at the same time i think a lot of people do that except that they might not have careers in them so people play music uh they do maybe some theater as a hobby they call it hobbies i think a lot of creatives have a difficult time having hobbies because exactly. they're like yes. you know that's work right yeah <laughs> exactly right so because yeah. you know, but for people working uh, in more in the more in the sort of corporate structures and uh, having had uh, more uh, structured educations and etc cetera, etc cetera, um i think they 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 have all these hobbies it's just that they really don't realize to, that that teaches them so many things as well that are so valuable so for everything else they do and we go like hey you you were in theater you know that is so relevant for when you want to put people together because when you talk about we have to put people, people together you know and 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 curate that that the dialogue and that's what you do in theater i mean that's that's what yeah. you do when you conscious when you exactly. do service service design is all about the audience it's about backstage in front you know etc cetera, etc cetera. it's all that language or the or those frames and and i when i listen to you that's kind of nice because i was writing down you use a lot of frames so and i mean by frames like you a frame is for instance orchestration right mm. that's that's a frame you use and that to make sense of things and and it may, to make it meaningful yes. for you and to know what you're doing so that language is is like that's sort of it's really interesting to hit, to to listen to yeah you. and it's interesting you you pick up on that as well because i often talk about it like now my job is running a business and mm, uh exactly i uh to me running a business is theater it's pure yeah. theater totally yes. you create the rituals that you need to bring people together to get mm. people to understand what your combined goals are uh what it is that you're working towards what is the story that you're looking to tell mm. uh what are those highs what are those lows what is acceptable what is not how do you hold each other when you're looking to fail how do you trust each other when you know you're looking to move in a certain direction it's theater yeah and in my head it makes perfect sense Amazing. why wouldn't it right like you've got you you need a person directing you need a person scripting how this may go you need people playing their part and you need it to all add up and it, and it's and for me that materiality is people mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. exactly and i 
I have long lost my craft of, uh, well, I haven't lost it. I can still build buildings, but you know, I've long lost my craft of, uh, can I make a prototype that is better than five other people sat around me in my studio? Possibly not. I'm I'm sure they're smarter than I am at it. And they know like, you know, the best Figma plugins and all the rest of it, which I don't know. But at the same point in time, uh, my craft is now working with people. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. And actually, across all of those journeys, the thing that I have learned is what I'm good at and the thing that I should possibly leave behind. So that's been an interesting way to navigate that journey as well. I am curious to see how that materiality manifests over the next few years, because I think I'm also also at that point where I'm curious to see where design goes. Mm -hmm. I'm just as curious to see uh, how I change as a leader with where design goes or almost irrespective of where design goes. Yeah, we when are. You talk, when you talk about different uh, skills or crafts that you have, is there one, um, and you talk about your being interested in everything, is there one that you're really drawn <laughs> to that you would like to add more to your toolbox right now? That's an interesting one. Um, I have an un, I won't say unbelievable because that'll make it sound like I'm being immodest. An unbelievably annoying attention to detail. I like to think I'm not in, I'm not <laughs> someone who swoops in and just say stuff and gets out. I'm not that person. But I'm also the person who can't hold back if I don't see things mm. done right. And what I mean by that is, it's always great fun, right? Like, so in, in my job, I'm seen as a person who's like responsible for the people. And, and I'm responsible for managing this large team of 110 and I'm responsible for making sure the work that we do is amazing. And I'm responsible for making sure we work with amazing clients and we deliver good work and all the rest of it. Right? Like That's what people expect of my job today. But what people don't sometimes remember is I went to design school. And so it's great when you're actually like reviewing like some, a prototype someone's built and, you know, they're, they're talking about like this, the flow or, or someone's built a deck and they're going to go present it to a client and, and, you know, if I step in and I'm just like, the kerning on that deck is not working. And people are like, wait, what? You know what kerning is? And I'm like, come on, people. Like, you know, I'm not going to let you get away with bad kerning or bad leading or whatever. Right? Like, And I think my, I'm obsessed and keep the bar very high on the quality of work. And there is a lot of stuff that I can't do. And I'm very comfortable with that right like tools have changed the craft has evolved over the time that i was at school and you know worse graduates coming out of school now but i can see when something's not right and if i actually put my mind into it i can fix it and that's irrespective of craft and i think that i like to think that's the one thing i want to hone in on more and spend more time on because the crafts are changing right like with ai being such a strong part of the mix of the creative process, what would that do? Like, have I spent six hours last week tinkering around with mid-journey? I haven't, but it'd be nice to try and figure out, you know, Mm -hmm. how that works. I mean, I know how it works, but I should spend some more time on it. So that, you know, I I keep a hang of some of those crafts, some of these new crafts that are evolving, because I'd love to. And I think that's the sort of thing I would be really interested in spending a lot of time on. I'm I'm obsessive about typography. If you, if, you, if you didn't hear it on the leading and the kerning. So, I mean, if I could spend two years going back to design school, just learning typography, I'd love to do that. Yeah. The Hague has a good Or maybe school. architecture. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, maybe at the Hague. Do you have an architecture school as well? Can I do a dual degree? I'd love to do it. Architecture and typography. <laughs> I feel like if, if anyone could find a way to combine them, I think it would be you. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, I'm I'm really curious. So, do you see anything that you uh, kind of um, took 
um, with you from your parents. Um, I wrote down one of the first things uh, that you said when you talked about your parents was, uh, you know, it's about, they are all about you. You don't, you don't give up. Um, and working really hard, um, you know, um, also you don't fail and, and you hope for the best and you, and you, and you pray a lot, but <laughs> are there elements, are there elements uh, from that, that you kind of go like, yeah, you know, that's in me as well. I took that with me, with me. I don't pray. So, you know, my mother was a little embarrassed for that, but, uh, everything else. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think what I, what I have from them is the sheer hustle that my parents have put into their lives mm. to be able to make of it anything that was made. So my mother is a nutritionist. She then focused on being a nutritionist for athletes during the Asian Games, which is the equivalent of the Olympics, but in Asia. Uh, then she gave up her career uh, when I was born, because I was born when she was 21, which is frightfully early. Um, and for the first few years of her life, she did she didn't do anything. She was busy raising me. And if you're a 21 year old raising a child, there's a great chance you shouldn't be doing anything else. Um, and then she started, hold your breath, a hobby center. And basically, she figured there were a couple of extra spaces in the house which were unused at certain points of time in the day when my grandparents were at work. And so, wouldn't it be amazing to bring all the children from the neighborhood into this hobby center and teach them something after school? So, it was an after school hobby center. And then she roped in like teachers who taught music, who taught dance, who taught painting. And like we had a little hobby center in our house and the house then turned back into the house after all the kids left. And so she ran that for a few years. I think they still get a few random calls because their number was in the directory if they run the hobby center still. It's quite funny. She then decided that she was going to bake for a living because obviously that makes absolute sense once you run a hobby center. <laughs> but she was a nutritionist. So I like to think like that is just the biggest irony of all. Like a nutritionist who bakes is just terrible. Anyway, <laughs> made money doing baking and she she bakes beautifully. And then, uh-huh. then and as we were, you know, as we were the phase where she decided to be a mushroom farmer, as one should be, because <laughs> why not, right? <laughs> when you've had too much sugar, you should grow mushrooms. And then hold your breath. She opened a spa because one should. <laughs> and then she ran that and got really bored and then got out of that partnership. And currently runs a travel agency because that makes absolute sense in the world. So <laughs> I need her to lie on a beach and do nothing, and go cycling and do all the things she loves how to do. But in her head, it all makes sense. Mm. Because she sees a problem and she does something to solve for it and she runs a business to solve for it and she makes some money doing it. And when she's bored, she clocks that off and then she goes and does something else. She doesn't come from a lot of me. Like, it's not like she's flush with cash and she can just go off. But she does it enough and it's self-contained enough. Unfortunately, COVID killed her travel business. She would have kept going. She set it up when I was 18. And, you know, she, she's been going since for many, many years. But... um. Yeah, it, it's it's incredible to watch that. So I think if I've taken one thing from my parents, my dad's done the same job all his life, but now paints. I will not comment on how he paints. He thinks he paints wonderfully. I think it, you know, he could put a little more effort into it. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, That's your, but they do you, look because you're things. obsessed with details. So you go like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, just you know, work a little harder, but. Um, <laughs> What I take from them is that ethos. I I take from them them one thing, actually. It's not just the hustle. I take from them a strong sense of integrity, of doing the one thing you do really well Mm. and nothing else but really well. Nothing else matters, actually. And my parents are both very lovely people and i think i i take some like i'm not i'm not that lovely like they're just unbelievably nice i'm okay but i think i take a sense of kindness from them right like i like to think if you're kind to the world my mother always told us growing up but you know please thank you and sorry changes everything you can do everything in the world if you can say please if you can say thank you if you can say sorry and when i was growing up it used to irritate me for her to say that all the time but right now in my life i can tell you for certain it works 
Absolutely. And so there's a yeah, you all turn into your parents basically. That's what I'm turning into. But you know, it's <laughs> it, there is a strong sense of integrity and kindness that I take from everything they've done. Mm-hmm. and i hold on to it i think that is what makes i like to think my form of leadership is about being spectacular at what you do in that moment and when you're done going home and doing something else awesome thank you very much i love the conversation thank you that's very very it's been nice. awesome thank now you. you know everything about my parents don't tell them that <laughs> <laughs>